Oh, cheers. Cheers. Cheers, me. Cheers. So, to be in networking, I'm here in Las Vegas. I'm Greg Farrow. I'm Derek Winkworth. And uh, I thought that uh, we've had some pretty good discussions with Derek over the years. You might know him as Cloud Toad uh, for various criminal reasons. Or quasi criminal. Quasi criminal. Quasi criminal. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you can't definitively prove it was against the law. No, no. But, uh, you know, we've certainly offended enough people with our discussion around is MPLS tunneling. I thought that was a classic. That was awesome. It was one of the best shows. Um, but what's all the rage this week, of course, we saw the big Cisco come out with its intent based networking or as they call it, intuitive networking, which is all based around the concept of intent, policy, and automation. Now, of course, Derek has work, is working for a company called Abstra. Full disclosure, Abstra is a sponsor of Packet Pushes, but this show is not sponsored by them. I just wanted to talk to somebody about the concepts of intent. Who's, I've got certain ideas about what intent networking looks like, but... Um, and I'm curious what those ideas are. Right. So tell me, Greg. So here's how I see it. Okay. So here's the story that I often tell. If I'm going to go up to a network and I'm going to connect the thing to the network, a server, a, a desktop, or a wireless access point or something like that, right, I'm going to uh, plug something into a port on a switch. So what's the first thing I have to think about? I have to think about, is the port active, is it not? Yep. Um, so I have to conf the port, turn it on. Then I have to think about what VLAN it needs to be in, or does it need to be a trunk port? So if I'm going to configure a VLAN, is the VLAN on the switch? If the VLAN's not on the switch, I'll have to configure it on the switch, and then I'll have to think about, do I need layer 3 routing for that switch? And if I need layer 3 routing for that switch, then... I need, but if, it, if I'm using a trunk port, then maybe I need to configure the VLAN on the switch, but then I need to configure the, uh, the level 2 VLAN trunking on the uplink yep. to the next switch. So now, all of a sudden, connecting a device to the network is about intent. My intent is I want to connect my server virtual switch, you know, my VM to a virtual switch, my uh, computer, desktop computer, my wireless, my iPhone. I want it to connect to the network in such a way that the network automatically configures itself. Yep. You could almost call it auto-magic network. That, that would actually be a better word, I think. Yeah, right. automagical. Like, yeah, automagical. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I like that. I should be in marketing, really. <laughs> Don't you think? <laughs> yeah. No, I think um, that could really work. Uh, yeah, and a... so, so the thing is that, so now if I break down those steps into sort of try and... Um, group them together into something logical. There's the intent, I want to connect this computer to the network. But there's all these things that happen beyond the scenes that you don't normally see. And But those things are normally driven by some sort of policy. That is, if I create a VLAN, this numbering scheme applies. If I add an IP address, here's my IP allocation scheme. If I'm going to create um, a spanning, if I'm going to figure a port at the edge of the network, well, here's my BPDU policy. I'm going to have BPDU guard and spanning tree protections and Blah, blah, blah. So, and if I'm going to create a VLAN, then it gets this spanning tree configuration. Yep. So that's like these little blobs of policy. Yep. So when I have to automate the, autom the, the configuration of all of these bits of policy just to do this thing that I intend, it's like this um, uh, you know, Rube Goldberg machine. You pull the lever and click, 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 you know, do, 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 all these things have to happen. But it's up to you to keep pushing the ball along. And is that... Is that a fair automagical intent-based networking summary? I've said this before and I'll, I'll say it again. There's, we've been working with all of these constructs, right? right. Our whole life, VLANs and uh, routing sessions and you know, routing peers and route tables and FIBs. And yep. you know, there's all these constructs that we deal with every day as network engineers. And we know what these things do and we know how they're configured, right? When I mm -hmm. say FIB, I'm, I'm thinking of things that are more in line to like the forwarding plane, like ACLs and QoS, right? That's sure, sure. Those are, in my mind, forwarding plane features. Then you have control plane things, like BGP sessions, route policy, stuff like that. Yeah. And, um, then you have channelization, right? I guess that's I guess that's going back to forwarding plane. Things like VLANs and mm. other kinds of like ways to channelize the data uh, or, you know, I guess virtualize is a fancier word, but it's really all about channelization. Yeah, yeah. Um, we've been dealing with that our whole life in, in one form of another, right? Going all the way back to the beginning, we're technologies that are long gone, but we've been doing, we've been dealing with the same constructs from the very beginning till now. And the question is, how come, if that's true, and there's like the same basic rules around the, and, and there are the same basic rules yeah. around these constructs from the beginning till now, then how come we're still doing everything by hand? How come we, yeah. how come we, we cannot we literally in, interpret all those policy things that I talked about in yeah. our heads? That's exactly right. Or we've got little config snippets that this is the 
edge port configuration. This is a this is how you add a VLAN to a port, or this is how you create a VLAN interface. And you, you know, and you you think of you finger bang the keyboard until all of those things are configured, right? And then theoretically you should get them right. But they're actually each of those pieces is ultimately repeatable. You don't need to um, like it, it's not magic. It's just I take this Lego block and this Lego block, and it looks like a starfighter. That's exactly right. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. you you standardized all you because you standardized your configuration, so you have a repeatable setup for this sort of stuff. And I, I, but automation, like writing your own scripts and you know doing all this stuff where you Python out and you Ansible or Salt Stack or Chef or Puppet or whatever it is, that seems to me like you know I'm creating a machine that when I pull the lever, all the gears rotate in fixed configurations, and that's actually not what I want. I want something that can take my simple it says if I'm going to connect this to the network then all these things have to happen but but what if there has to be like all of these if 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 I'm doing it this way then this has to happen but if you're doing it all automatically with Python statically with a Python Ansible shell puppet chip you know you end up with like a machine that's like made out of wood and you pull it and the gears all move one position forward right a clinkety clank and yeah so you know and what, it's not flexible it's not flexible in yeah. fact this is one of this is kind of funny. The uh, so there's this term out in the universe called impedance mismatch, right? It's an electrical engineering term. Love this one. Yeah, I know. I, it's my one of my favorite terms because um, <laughs> all things in IT boil down to impedance mismatch. Every single Let's problem you can think of. Explain what impedance mismatch is. Well, it means like two things that seem like they should be working together, but are actually different, and because of those differences, those. Uh, sometimes um, not immediately obvious differences, you run into problems after design, after implementation, right? Yeah. So um, it's like when you put a Cat5 cable into a Cat6 connector, Yes. you get an impedance mismatch. And the signal comes along and on the Cat5 cable and hits a Cat6. And because the propagation mediums are different and the signaling characteristics, what actually happens is when the signal transitions across the boundary, you get all these reflections. Right? That's exactly right. right? And so your, your signal, when you actually plug a Cat5 into a Cat6 cable, you actually get worse signal performance, not nothing. Because where the signal matches, that the impedance is, and you get reflections, yeah. and your signal goes to poop. So that is the literal de definition yeah. of impedance mismatch. There's, but it's been borrowed for other things, right? Yeah. So um, I'll give you an example. In the software world, there's SQL, right? Mm. And SQL has all of its own data types. And then you have programming languages like mm. C and Python and Perl and uh, all of them, right, that, that have always existed. Yeah. And none of the data types in any of those languages happen to align with the data types that are in SQL. So if you want to, oh, that is, that's criminal. That's uh, criminal. We're just, we're just going to have to pause here. Yeah, let's think, pause. Let's fix this situation. So we're just going to have to go to the bar. Here, let's I'm going to, okay, let's go to the bar. Yes. Okay, so that so um, that crime was addressed. So, and that was close. Yes, we are close. now. Yes. So that was the first beer. First beer. This is the second beer. So, We've only got one more beer to finish this up. Okay. So uh, we better hurry because before we lose people. Okay. So, anyways, um, yeah. So in SQL, there's it has its own data types, and pro other programming languages they have their own data types. Yeah, yeah. And when you try to import SQL connectors into any other language, you have to deal with the fact that the data types do not match. And you have to write code to deal with that, right? Yeah. And and that right there is is, is a form of impedance mismatch. Yeah. And lots of mistakes in coding are made just interfacing one language to another in programming. Well, it turns out that when you write network automations and you write them in something like Python or Perl, and you write them in such a manner that they have a beginning and an end, you execute them, they start, they finish, that kind of script, we'll call it a linear script, yeah. um, 
that is an impedance mismatch because the network is not linear in any way. It's a living thing, and it's it doesn't have a start or an end. And, and it's um, not static because you add and, stuff, and it, you delete stuff. And it's not static. Physically, like add switches, delete switches in the campus or if you're in the data center, you're constantly adding servers, deleting servers. That's exactly and, right. And the state of the network underneath the program, the SDN program, if you will, I might be overusing the word SDN there, but hey, it'll, it's, it's good enough. Uh, you know, if bandwidth increases or, or decreases for some reason, it might change your performance for some reason. So the program, the, the automation that you create or the, the software control that you create has to be fluid or dynamic to adapt to changes in the system. That's right. right? You've got to be able to reconfigure it. In theory, what we really want is for our system to be com configured and our intent to be captured. You know, this machine is an important machine, therefore it has a high priority across the network, like it's the gaming server or something, like the real <laughs> important server. Yep, yep. Right? Or as I always say, make sure the CEO's machine gets the worst performance level because that guarantees you'll get the best funding. So you always put the, the CEO's machine in the lowest possible category. Because if he doesn't get the worst... Oh, that's a good strategy. I like that. Yeah. I, haven't, I haven't heard of that. Yeah, because then you could go to the boss and say the CEO is having terrible performances because the network's slow. And then you get money for the upgrade. So you really want this intent to capture your... This idea of intent or as Cisco's calling it intuitive networking after their big product launch last week. Astra calls it intent. Other people are using the intent-based networking. Um, not Nokia with their big launch last week around the uh, Alkaloo 7500 SRX platform with their FP4 processor. They've got a fancy name to it yep. as well. I can't remember. Yeah, I can't remember. They've, it, got yeah. a, they've got a, like an intent, intuitive, something, something. Yeah, everyone's trying to capture this, right? Yeah, they want to, and, but they always want to use a different word because their version is better or something. Sure, sure. So, and fine, but it all fundamentally works down to this. If, if you could capture the intent, this configure, this workstation is allowed to connect to the network. It's allowed this level of, I want to assign this level of importance to it. I want it to get this much performance. I want it to exist for this long. Yep. Then the network should automatically assume and know how to make that a cap. That's right. So within the within the design of the network, there are patterns, right? Mm -hmm. And it should know within the constraints of you know those patterns because you don't want it to introduce random patterns when things connect. You want it to consistently produce uh, you know this the same pattern over and over as close as possible whenever changes are happening, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so within the constraints of the design of the network, you want it to automate those kind of changes so that it, you know, when you add new things, it automatically knows what to do. And it, and it's really, and that's how you express your intent. You say, well, here's a basic design pattern I want for my network. And, and so when people do these things, I want that basic design pattern to be implemented over and over again, mm. um, following these rules, right? Yeah. And, um, and then even if there is some variation in the network, that allows that to happen. Um... Ah, all right. All right. All right. All right. All right. Whew. Oh, the guy over there, he just talks about network all day. Yeah, the, it wouldn't shut the, up. Wouldn't Jeez. shut up. Sorry about that. As if that's the only so, thing is networking. I mean, well, he knew a lot. All right, yeah, yeah, that's maybe. That's so what, what were we, we were talking about, uh, what was it, where were we up to? Oh, geez. Okay, so we were talking about basic design patterns in the network, right? And how, um, if you... It's, if, not, it's not that good, this it's, it's not good. That good. It's okay. Oh, all right. It's okay. But we're in Las Vegas. It should be better, right? It, well, there's no good beer in Vegas. Like, it's really hard to find a beer bar in the Mandalay Bay. Like, yeah. at the convention centers, like on the casinos, it's all cocktails and shots and... And wine. And, and sadness. Yeah, it's and, not and, and failure. Just, this whole place stinks of We failure. have to walk, like, quite a distance to get... There is a, a couple mm. good beer places here, but it's not worth the walk. I just wanted to let you know that this is a real problem. Seriously. How hard it is to find good beer in Vegas is a real trauma. It is cr actually you would think that it would be easy because um, because it's Vegas. People come here to get you know hammered. drunk, hammered, <laughs> and spend all their money. Why would they make that easy? I don't know. Cocktails just seem like sadness to me. Yeah, they, they are. They're sadness. So networking. We were talking about into, where were we? Um, design patterns. Design patterns. That's design right. Design patterns. Yes. So design you, patterns. you express your intent through these design patterns and then the system yeah. will automate yeah. the network underneath based on the constraints um, that are sort of derived from those design patterns. Can I deviate? Is this where models come in? Yeah. So this, this is... idea of models, Yang is really starting, like Yang as a as a model driven API actually starts to make sense? Um, a little bit. It does, but Yang doesn't actually describe design patterns. It, des it describes actual things in the network like interfaces and route tables and stuff yes. like that. 
And but there's, as a model-driven software, that means you have to sort of like a model of the route table, not a like it's not like a database where you're populating this into this and this into this and this into this. It's much more like here's a model, and then what what's underneath the model is actually hardware dependent. That actually just goes away. Yeah, that's exactly right. Right. Yeah. It's very similar. Right. Yeah. Very similar. And and actually, you know, you have a control systems background, right? An engineering background with some control systems. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So control systems. Um, there's something about intent networking that's very, very uh, feedback closely feedback. related feedback to, loops? that's exactly right, um, these closed feedback loops, right? You you express constraints onto the control system itself, mm. and then it has actuation, and then it has feedback from the plant, which is the network. So this is where telemetry comes in. Yes, exactly every right. In, every intent-based system has to have telemetry to say, I configured this, and and it goes through all of this, blah, 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 blah. And then you have to measure if that's what actually happened. Yes. And that's why telemetry is such a critical part of intent. It is. And it's more than just measuring whether or not the config is correct. It's measuring re whether or not the network is is actually delivering on um, right. the intent yep. behind the configuration, right? Okay. I put my foot on the accelerator. You see the speedometer get to 100 kilometers an hour. You take your foot off. That's a feedback loop. You're the yep. driver. That's exactly right. And you know what? Intent doesn't mean a whole lot unless you have that feedback loop. Right. Yeah, I want to connect this workstation to the network. Is its packets now flowing? That's exactly right. <laughs> and if they're not, you failed in your executing your intent. Therefore, you must go into what an error correction. Yep, some kind of error. You know, a notification, error yep. correction. Um, you know, depending on the complexity of the issue. Yeah. And of course, you know, we're in the very beginning of of, of really addressing the network in this manner, and uh, which means that you know. Um, and this is very important for the network engineers that are watching. You might be sitting there thinking to yourself, wow, it's just going to automate all of us away. It's not going to automate all of you away. What it's no. going to do is it's going to help you be more effective as a network engineer. It's going to tell you when there's an issue that you need to actually yeah. address, yeah. right? And it's going to help you You're not address the actual problem faster. Yeah. The problem is workstation not connected to network, not packet loss, VLAN trunking, right. blah, blah, blah. What or, you need to know. Or even more vague, it's it's gonna it's not gonna be you rolling in Tuesday morning and getting a call from I think what was her name Ellen I use <laughs> I use this example Ellen yeah <laughs> you're not gonna get an angry call from Ellen on Tuesday that says you know you can't even understand her because she's yelling into the phone she's like this isn't working what's happening and it's like that is that should not be your feedback that something is wrong Damn, in the network yeah. yeah when you're on the help desk and Ellen calls and you're going like oh Jesus it's Ellen it's Ellen again. <laughs> Oh. Right, you need something better than, than getting yelled at to know whether or not the feedback the, the network is working. So intent is not only this, you know, model driven intent policy implementation configuration automation. It's also telemetry and a feedback loop that says did the intent actually execute the way that you intended? That's exactly right. Was the workstation right. connected? That is, is exactly right. Is the server right. in the data center? You configured a cost profile. Did the cost profile meet the criteria? Do you know? And detecting that and then signaling to you. Signaling to the human to say your intent that you configured, we addressed it as this, and it didn't work. You've got a problem. Yep. And therefore, you need to close the feedback loop. But that doesn't necessarily involve futzing around with the keyboard doing show run commands on a box. Oh, that's exactly right. And actually, um, you know, this is also very important, right? You know, um, for me, intent based. You know, there. So you have this sort of highbrow aspect that we've been talking about, but the but the. But the more tactile aspect, the more like you know rubber meets the road aspect is that as a network engineer, it should be helping you solve problems and you should be spending less time doing exactly that, typing show commands and trying to build a picture of what's going on in the network manually. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, which which is which which lead you know, when people say eighty percent of the outages in the network are because of human error, it's because you know, every time there's a problem, people are manually reconstructing what is happening in the network in their ma in their mind, yeah. and they're doing it with show commands, right? So you're an intent-based networking system in your head. Yeah. And really, we're sort of trying to express this in software. You're trying you're trying to figure out what the intent is. You're trying to figure out what the problem is, and yeah. then you're trying to figure out what the solution is. And you know, but if the, you get any okay, of so those the key, steps wrong, I think wrong, the key here is is that networks. You know, when I started in networking, say 25 years ago, networks were 12 computers connected together on a coax cable. Yep. And it was really easy to understand intent. And yeah, now they we should have, be all be talking. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's pretty straightforward. Yeah. No, literally, I made a lot of money out of selling a 12-node net, Novell Netware 2.1 network. It was great. I made a lot of beer out of that. Cheers. Cheers.
and and you get to this point where uh, but now you've got this what 500 vms in your server farm or a thousand devices connected to campuses oh and there are all, branches all different your, security zones and like you know yeah it's crazy it's, now. it's not possible for you to carry it all in your head it's an, it, yeah it's, it's exactly right well it's becoming impossible or impractical for you and so you have to be superhuman. So this was, a, if you watched my previous episode where I talked about being superhuman, that's where I'm trying to say is this automation allows you to be better than human. Not that, um, because automation allows you to be more accurate than human or faster than human or better informed than you could be if you were doing it manually. And that's the purpose behind yeah, superhuman. Yeah, that's exactly right. Mr. Winkworth, as always, what a disgusting pleasure it is to have you around. Yeah, cheers again. Cheers. Let's finish it, right? So oh, thanks. wow, I, I'm, I gotta catch up. You, I'm sure you'll have no problems. Look, uh, thanks for listening to us talk about uh, intent-based networking here on Two Beer Networking. Uh, this is my second beer, and I'm Greg Farrow from the Packet Pushers. Uh, if you've uh, enjoyed this, maybe you should go over to packetpushers.net and uh, check out our blog posts and our podcasts. And, uh, yeah, I'll be back in a couple of weeks. Well, if I ever get out of Vegas alive, that is. See you then. Thanks, yeah. everyone. <laughs>